Perfect. Um, Adriana will begin. Thank you. So today we welcome people of all gender identities and expression, people of all racial, ethnic, and cultural groups, people of all economic and immigration status, whatever that may be, people of all sexual orientation, people who have practiced mindfulness for years or those who are brand new to it, people, people of any marital status and any sort of relationship status, people of all faiths, traditions or not faith tradition, introverts, extroverts, <coughs> sorry, people whose primary language is English or any other language, people of all ages, young, and young at heart, people from any place on earth. And we welcome our bodies here, whatever our measure of wellness at this moment, whatever shape or size our body is. We welcome those who are living with a chronic medical condition, visible or invisible. We welcome all of our aspirations, our dreams, our desires and passions, and all of our emotions, our joy and bliss, our grief, our numbness, our frustrations, contentment, disappointment, edginess, those who feel 100% calm and at ease and those who are not. Those who support you to be here, those, of, those people and beings who made it possible for us all to be here. We welcome our elders and our teachers, those who are here with us in our lives and those who have passed away and those to be born. And we welcome this space, this virtual space, and the places where each of us are, the houses, the homes, the land, Mother Earth, and all her inhabitants. And we welcome the spirit of the indigenous peoples, the first people who lived on the land that each of us presently occupy, including, as we mentioned, the Piscataway people in Washington, DC. And is there anyone else who would like to be welcomed? And you can put that in the chat. Mm, something came up for me in terms of welcoming all those who haven't got enough privilege to be here with us today. Thank you. We are a privileged group. Thank you. Yes. They're with us too. Thank you. Yeah, so welcome to everyone. Welcome to all. And as you probably know, we, um, we practice mindfulness as part of this Making Visible um, project. And what really got us started on this project is our own interest in understanding better so that we can transform our own suffering and the suffering that's in the world. And we practice in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, at least Adriana and I do, but not all of the speakers do. Um, and so we're gonna begin with the bell and with, I'll read a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who's uh, our teacher. Um, but at first I also wanted to thank everyone who donated to our project over the last two months. You guys thank have you. been amazing. We, we really didn't know how we were gonna keep going because we had a grant from the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation last year and they this year they felt like they had to spread the money around so we didn't get another grant <laughs> and so um we really appreciating even if you send five or ten dollars it makes a huge difference um and we're just so so delighted that so many people want to see this project continue so thank you thank you thank, thank you. you thank you thank you all thank you so much and if you can't contribute money if you just send us a note and say thank you that's a good contribution too yes <laughs> So any feedback, it's also welcome. And that's an enormous contribution for all. Yes. So we'll begin with three sounds of the bell. Uh, actually, I'm going to read the quote first, and then we'll have the three okay. sounds of the bell, and then we'll turn it over to Adriana. We'll um, introduce our speaker, David. So I'll start with the quote from Thich Nhat Hanh from the book, No Mud, No Lotus. He says, with mindfulness, 
you can recognize the presence of the suffering in you and in the world. And it's with that same energy that you tenderly embrace the suffering by being aware of your in-breath and out-breath. You generate the energy of mindfulness so that you can continue to cradle the suffering. Practitioners of mindfulness can help and support each other in recognizing, embracing, and transforming suffering. With mindfulness, we are no longer afraid of pain. We can go further and make good use of suffering to generate the energy of understanding and compassion that heals us and we can help others to heal and be happy as well. And he goes on to say, we offer these practices to ourselves, to our loved ones and to the larger community. This is the art of suffering and the art of happiness. With each breath, we ease suffering and generate joy. With each step, the flower of insight blooms. We hope that this webinar may be of service in helping your insight bloom tonight. I'll turn it to Adriana and I'm going to make sure everyone is muted as we move into this next part of the webinar. And I suggest if you're not on speaker view, you might just, you might click speaker view in the top right corner so that you can better see David as he's speaking and sharing. And another uh, request, it, it, it will be better if we don't use the chat during uh, David uh, sharing. We can we can wait and and if you have any question uh, we can we can open the chat after he finished his, his sharing. But if you have any problem, a technical problem, and you need help, then please let us know. But we will try not to distract David in, in this moment. Thank you, thank you, everyone. And um, today we have the honor to have David Sempe with us. And David shared with us that in 1993, uh, David Sampe was 19 years old and confined at a Correction Corporation of America, now Civic Corp facility, the first wave of prisons for profit. He was placed in a youth act program that kept him and others like him locked in a six by nine cell for eight months, 23 half and a half hours a day. A part of him that went into that box never came out. Broken like Humpty Dumpty, he was left to put himself back together again. Several years later, after multiple arrests and felony conviction, he became mentally unhinged and spiraled out of control. Over the course of 25 years, David has reconstructed his mind piece by piece and through the practice of mindfulness and meditation has turned a broken mind into a resilient one. This experience have equipped him with the tools to guide men and women coming home from prison out of their fractured state and back into balance. We, we, we are really grateful and we are opening the floor now to David. And thank you, David, again, for sharing this moment with us. Um, I think I'm going to start this, um, this talk, this webinar, in the same fashion that I use with my workshops. Um, with my workshops, we use music. 
Music is universal. It pushes emotion. And I'll use each, because this is my first webinar, not dealing with people in person. I hope that uh, this is effective. I'm gonna start uh, with our first transitional song. Now, I normally use this song here to give gratitude, to give thanks. In a time like this, it's very difficult. You think about all the things that you don't have. Yeah. You think about the state that our country, that the world is in. Yeah. And why is this happening to me? Yeah. But I feel that this is an important time to dig deep inside yourself and think about all the things that you do have, all the things that you love, the things that money can't buy, and to focus your mind there and say, thank you. And I find that if you keep your mind there, your spirit there, you have so much to be grateful for and the things that to complain about fall by the wayside so I'll reinstate that with thank you thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in to this talk today and um, I appreciate it I'd like to say thank you to Adrian and Adriana and Annie and making visible in, in this platform that they've provided me with. I'd also like to say thank you to all my friends and family out there and who's everybody who is struggling. Thank you for tuning in today. And with this song here, I'd just like for you guys to take a moment out to practice your own gratitude. and dig deep inside your hearts and ask yourself, what are you thankful for? You'll see that with a lot of um, what we do here with Article 730 and, uh, and my organization, how do you invoke emotion? You know, with the work that I do, I, I try to inspire people to think differently. Men and women who've been formerly incarcerated, who've had who've gone through lots of trauma, who've dealt with, who are dealing with PTSD, who are dealing with PICS, we call post-incarceration syndrome. And the question is, 
how do you engage individuals who've gone through so much trauma and get them to reinvest in their spirit? How does that happen? People have been so scarred by life itself. And I found that with dealing with this particular um, group of individuals, that you the only true way to approach them is through lived experiences. Because that's where the good stuff is. Uh, things that they can relate to. And whenever I come into a class, you know, I try to, first of all, break them from their normal daily patterns of thinking. How do you get someone who has gone through 25 years of prison and have them to sit down and breathe with you? Well, that's a transition. You have to really kind of work with somebody before they're gonna sit down after going through so much trauma and be trusting. So one of the first things I'll do is I'll come into a class and I'll talk about the duality of life itself. You know, how many times do we think about the duality in life? Whether you're talking about, you know, the universe with, to every, to the earth, there's, there's a moon the duality of that, the duality of the seasons, to every winter, there's a summer, to every right, there's a left, to every night, there is day. And you can't talk about the masculine without the feminine. And when these two entities come together, they create one and showing them that within everything, it's two halves to a whole, yeah? And there is a duality in the breath itself. And for, once your mind starts to think differently, we kind of focus that on the breath. And um, when engaging with them about lived experiences, one thing that if anyone has gone through trauma as myself, there is a, to every higher self, which everyone in here can associate with, the path to enlightenment. There is a lower resonation also, the lower self, that kind of fight or flight mode. Whatever caused that trauma, there's a way to find the two halves to that whole. So, because if you can find the lower resonation, you can find the higher. Yeah, you can, you can, you can think about it. And uh, when engaging with individuals who've gone through trauma, I try to go through those particular lived experiences. In one particular class that I was, that I came to, and I, and I hope this, this doesn't uh, startle you, but it was a lot of high risk youth. Now this particular class, extremely rowdy, extremely disrespectful. And the last thing in the world they were going to do was sit still and meditate. Just wasn't gonna happen. Now, how do you reach these kind of indi this individual? How do you reach a class like this? And I had no time to think there was nothing planned, but I approached the class and I raised up on them and I said, it's Anybody been in this situation and I, and I raised up and I imitated automatic gunfire. Ba, 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 ba. Now, everybody in that class who had been gone through this, who had been traumatized by gang violence or whatever kind of violence, they were very familiar with this. And I explained to them, yes, that's what happened. The automatic gunfire, very fast but that's not the way you remember it. You remember it slowly. Boom. 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 Why is that? 
what happened there. At this point, I let them know, you've all have the, had the, uh, the ability to slow down time through fight and flight. This is something they attach to. They're familiar with this. But then I also let them know that through the breath, we can control this. See, there's things going on in your body that when your body takes over, that you're unaware of. Now let's dig into that. Um, that allowed this class, this workshop, to become fully engaged and, um, and allowed the class work, the breath work, to become effective. Um, trauma situations allows people to see the polar opposites. If, uh, if anybody knows, I'm sorry. Take a break. I kind of lost my place for a second. Let me just take a breath for a second. Everybody just kind of breathe with me and give me a thumbs up if you can. I'm just this. I'm gonna switch gears. I wanna talk about the duality and shifting focus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold for one second, please. Oh my gosh, one second. I apologize so much. My son is up there. He had me so distracted. <laughs> He's yelling and screaming. All right, so, um, let me just let me let me rebegin. Let me let me start this over if I can. Um, with the work that I do, with the individuals um, who are high risk, high trauma, it's very difficult to get folks like this into meditation, into mindfulness, and um, we I use different techniques. Once again. I was speaking about the lived experience. Um, this lived experience is something that they can associate with, that they can, that they can, that they, that they understand well, because they've, if anyone has been through trauma, you understand that fight flight response, but that is the lower self, the lower self taking over. And if you can envision that, then you can understand what the higher self is, yeah? And that offers myself a window of opportunity to be able to talk about the spirit. Um, with dealing with men and women who have been formerly incarcerated, I've seen the busloads of people coming in and I started to think, where is the epicenter of this? How can we stop this? Because no matter how many people I can get to think differently, there's another bus coming in right behind them. Where does this all happen? Where does this all start? And so I got to a consensus, took a consensus of people around and, and each and every person agreed that this issue if they ever had a second or a chance 
to make a shift or a pivot in their life. It was through the ages of 11 and 14, that middle school era. And that's when my organization, Article 730, shifted gears and started to really disrupt that school to prison pipeline right there at the epicenter. Uh, one of my programs that I developed uh, is, a, is a program called Music Therapy. Now, I use this with my son. We started it off. It was just kind of written on paper. But it took, uh, when, I, when I introduced it to a class setting, it took on a whole new case study where it created a synergy inside of this class where I was I would ask, instead of, I'd ask something about something that could have been traumatizing to students and ask them, instead of trying to talk about it, find a song to it. Now, when we offered that, that came really easy. They were able to communicate effectively about their own trauma through music. But what I wasn't prepared for was the energy that they created within that class. Because at this age is when kids are, they have no empathy and they're definitely not vulnerable. But when we ask them to create, or when we ask them to talk about their trauma through music, it came very easy. And what music offers, just like I was saying earlier, off, what it offers is a feeling something beyond words that each and every person in this class felt. And then afterwards we'd ask, so how did the song that you played resonate with how you feel? Well, then it opened up the floodgates for them to be able to talk openly about it. And then what we found was that others felt the same way too. So it didn't just open up empathy, it opened up vulnerability that we never planned for. And they, these are just a few of the techniques that, um, that I use to engage with, uh, with high trauma uh, individuals and, post, and, and folks coming out of incarceration as a means and a door to begin the healing process. With that being said, I think I'm going to start talking about um, opening the door to what is anti-Black racism. I don't know if, if you guys are as confused as I am when it comes to that. Because, and when I think about anti-Black racism, I see the duality and the concept itself. And when talking about it, I think it's just almost impossible because I can talk about the history, black history, and, and but I don't think that anything can convey what it must feel like to wear black skin. And I feel like the only um, effective way is maybe through storytelling, yeah? A friend of mine today, Khadija Clifton, I think she's on, on online today, when, I, when we brought up the subject about what is anti-Black racism, she used the analogy. She was like, you can write about and type about riding a bike, but nothing can match the experience. There's no way that all the writing or telling you in the world can give you the experience of what riding a bike is like. And I, and I, and I, to share, I said that that, um, that is a great analogy for trying to describe what experiencing racism is like being black. There's no way. It's always here. It's all you. There's never a chance or time in the day that you can take this off, and it sticks with you. Um, I'd like to tell a, try to tell a story, if I can.
And for the sake of the story, I'd like to change your name. Let's just, you can give this person any name. You can just close your eyes and imagine a kid. His name is Jerome, Jerome. Um, you can just think of a name. Put a name in your side your head, but this kid, he lived in the ghetto. And his community had been redlined, forced into this ghetto. He'd been discriminated against. He was told things about himself that, um, that were untrue. He was stereotyped. His family was systematically um, put in deplorable conditions. Now, I can be talking about anybody. I could be talking about Jerome down the street or give him any name. But these, the things that I'm talking about is, um, uh, the story that I'm attempting to tell was attempting to tell. Um, didn't happen down the street in Southeast Washington, DC. But the same conditions happened in Warsaw, Poland in 1941, in the center of the Holocaust. And for 13 years, a particular group of people a particular group of people were exterminated, were disenfranchised from their communities. And still to this day, we feel the ripple effect of that. We understand what 13 years can do to a people. Whenever we discuss the Holocaust, we understand how much pain a people suffered. But how many times do we think about the ripple effect of 400? What does that do to a people? What kind of lasting effect, what kind of psychological damage does that do to a people? And how do we heal from that? How do we begin a conversation of healing for 400 years? And what does it look like? With that, I'd like for us to sit with that for a second. And I'd like to try a little breath work with everyone here. Yeah? I'd like for everybody to kind of relax in their chair and get a comfortable position. Gently close your eyes and sit up straight. Use your upper diaphragm. And when I ask, I'm going to ask you to breathe in deeply for four seconds. 
I'm going to ask you to hold your breath for four seconds and then let out your breath deeply. And then we're going to repeat. Deep breaths in, hold at the top and release. Deep breaths in. Hold at the top and then release. Repeat. Deep breaths in, everyone. Hold at the top for three, two, and release. I want you to try to acknowledge the breath. Bring all of your awareness and your attention to your breath. And if your mind flutters off, let it flutter. And come back to the breath. Deep breaths in. Hold. Release. Repeat, deep breaths. Hold. And release. Continue. Deep breaths. Deep breath in and release. Everybody do one more round and then breathe in your normal pace. You can keep your eyes closed or softly, gently open them. We're gonna do three rounds of deep breaths and go into a short meditation. Continue with your normal breath. And let's do an initial deep breath in. Hold. And release. Deep breath through the nose, deep. Hold. And release. Continue. Deep breaths. And you can finish up with that last breath and return to your natural breathing state. And we're going to do one last round. Take one initial, initial breath in. Release, and then we're gonna start. Deep breath through the nose, deep breath. Hold at the top. And release. Deep breath in through the nose. Hold. and release. Continue a few more cycles.
and let you take your last breath cycle and return to your normal breath. And now on your own, I want everyone to just take a few minutes of mindfulness and just sit with yourself and your thoughts and your normal breath. Feel free to close your eyes. And we're going to meditate for, let's just, let's do a solid seven minutes if it's okay. Hmm. Solid seven minutes. It's not a good time.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Before we wrap things up, I'd like to share a story. This is my own lived experience and how at 18 years old, my window to spirituality began. I've told this story a few times um, and I hope it resonates today. Now, how do you find your spirit through trauma? How do you find your spirit through these lived experiences? And my journey began in the early 90s, 1992, if I'm not mistaken. I was 18 years old. And um, I was on the wrong side of town. Um, I remember a friend, and I, a friend of mine, his name was Derek. We were outside the whole day and we were up to a bunch of things that we probably weren't supposed to be doing. We planned on going to the movies that day. When we finished doing whatever we were doing in the street, we said we were going to the movies. And we had planned on leaving where we were on the street, walking through a building, walking through an alley, and continuing where we were going. And um, as we were walking to the door, and the door was open for me to walk through the building, through the alley, through the street, I was stopped at that door by a feeling and I just stood there stuck at that door not being able to move and it was just a feeling that says something's not right in what we call intuition yeah and I stood there what seemed like stuck in time for that whole summer. I feel like I'm still stuck there now. That decision, that intuition came in. And as I was sitting there, a friend of mine pulled up in the street in a car and he said, hey man, take a ride with me. And I knew that that right there, that was my out. So instead of walking through that door, I chose to tell my friend, hey listen, whatever our plans were, they just changed. Instead of going right, I went left. I jumped in that car with a friend of mine and I turned to him and I said, something's just not right today. I feel like somebody was going to die. I never forgot those words. And we drove off into the sunset. End of story. The person who I was with walked through that door where there were two gunmen waiting for him. They weren't waiting for him. They were waiting for me. And as soon as he walked through that door, he was shot five times. And why, while they shot him, they told him, they asked him, where is David? Because that's who they were looking for. That guy, thank God he lived, to tell the story. But I never forgot that day. I never forgot that intuition and that glimpse into my spirit and I learned to never ignore that voice again. 
And that was my introduction at 18, that there was more to this thing called life. There was something deeper. And that's where my journey began. Thank you for letting me share. I'm gonna close this meeting in the same way it started. The same music, the same gratitude. And I just wanna say thank you. And with that, I'd like to read a poem. That's, I believe that's very relevant to right now. My father sent me this poem just the other day. And I'd like to read it to you now. And I'll read it in his words. I was sent a poem yesterday written in the 1800s. And it's very appropriate today. And it states, And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened deeper. Someone meditated, someone prayed, Someone danced, someone met their shadow, and people began to think differently, and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless, and heartless, even the earth began to heal. And when the danger ended, and people found each other, grieved for the dead and they made new choices. They dreamed new visions and created new ways of life and healed the earth completely just as they were healed themselves. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity in these trying times, I appreciate you. Um, thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. With that being said, bless you all. Thank you so much, David. That was beautiful and moving sharing um we are going to open up for questions but before we do that um i wanted to just ask you david if you could elaborate on some things would you be willing to oh absolutely because I, I feel like i lost my place a few times within the speech so please okay um well one of the things i would be interested in hearing is how um how you and your um thinking and in your experience have seen the connection between being in the skin that you're in and incarceration, but also um, your life experiences and trauma and how those two things, how those relate to each other. Mm, could you, could you, could you rephrase that just, a, I mean, could you? Sure. Yeah. How is it that being in the skin that you're in has um, affected or connected with being incarcerated and being, um, and the, the PTSD that you see in the young men you work with, can you share more about from your perspective, how that, how those things relate? Oh, I mean, um, I, I believe that just, you know, let me try to connect it with a story. Um, I can remember being young and when it was the first time, one of the first times that it, 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 it really hit me. Um, you see, jail, prison to a young black boy in the 90s was marketed to us. You got to realize what that means when I say marketed to us. 
as a rites of passage. See, we didn't know it was a rites of passage. It was being marketed. It was in the music. It, it was ingrained in the culture. And one of the points that I wanted to get to when I was talking about ghettos is ghettos, red line districts, these are communities that were designed for us. See, we didn't choose to live in the ghetto. They chose for us to be placed here. Just look at it. Just look at the, 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 the discriminatory practices when ghettos projects were formed. Now, what I want to take that to is, is to say that when in like prison, as a young black man in the 90s, especially, was viewed as a rites of passage. And in one of my stints, being very young, I'd climbed to one of the top tiers while being incarcerated. And everyone is dressed in these orange jumpsuits. And I looked over the tier. And for that split second, I seen seas of black faces. Everything in there was black. What is this? Are we the only people committing crimes? No. So right then and there, it hit me that this is not a rites of passage. We've been bamboozled. This is the design. And that's when it truly hit me that no longer was I gonna be a part of this. And I was gonna do everything from that day forward to shift the focus and to expose um, this reality that we were that we were living under, that we were placed here. We didn't choose to be here. And I don't know if that answers your question, but it touches on it. That was really a wonderful answer. And if I can just piggyback on that, what you just said was that then once you saw that, you knew you wanted to do something about it. And that's really the whole mission of this project is for people to see and then to be motivated to because they see it to do something. And so um, I'm curious how mindfulness played into that. I, I think what I heard you say or read in your bio was that at that moment, you know, you really discovered mindfulness and that helped you to transform your suffering into the kind of wisdom that you have now and the work you do. But maybe you could explain a little bit about that. Well, I, I, once my, my son and I was, ha was, was having, we had a conversation, I believe it might, earlier today. And, uh, you know, my son's 12 years old. He's at the height of his social life. And he's starting to suffer. And I asked him, I said, what's wrong? And he says, um, he says, dad, you know, I'm, I'm afraid that I'll never see my friends again. I'll never go to school again. I'll never be able to congregate like we were. This was the height of my, of my social life. And it was all ripped away from me. And I reassured him that life is funny like that. Life has its, you know, life is, is like this. It, all of our lives in that we're the same. All of our lives share peaks and valleys. And you have to not personalize it. See, this thing called life, even though when it sucks, it's not just happening to you. Don't personalize it, son, is what I told him. You know, you have to, you have to accept the ups and the downs. And that is the great, that is the universal design of life itself. And that if you can find the beauty in the struggle, then there never is an up. There never is a down. There's always a balance. And thank you. You are, you know, really, that is an alignment with Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings to a T. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the idea that you need the mud in order to generate the lotus. 
you know, you transform it. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Adriano, you want to ha have a question and then we can open it to the rest of the people. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you again. This has been really inspiring. I, I want to ask you, Annie, if you can uh, uh, like elaborate more in your project of 730. I know that it comes from a, an assessment, I think, that they do in jail or in prisons about mental health. It has to be with mental health and how uh, this concept or this hour or this time of 730 became your project and why you are linking that 730 concept to your actual life. Well, thank you. Article 730, uh, in the judicial system, Article 730 is a procedure to see uh, whether a defendant is mentally competent to stand trial. So if you, you listen to court procedures and they're offered Article 730, that's just a procedure to see if if this particular defendant is capable, mentally competent. And that's why I chose Article 730. But with inside the walls, 730 in the morning and 730 at night is when they release particular inmates to, to the pill line, to where they get medication for psychological uh, issues. So inside of prison, People are labeled 730, meaning they're crazy. But within the prison walls, being deemed as crazy is not necessarily a bad thing. It's the kind of thing that keeps people at distance, at bay. And it, it's looked at as instead of a slight, people wear the name 730 behind the walls as a... Um, it's, it takes on a different form where it's not, it's not as, as offensive and people use it as a badge to say, fine, yes, I actually am 730. So I use that as, you know, the name of a, my foundation, Article 730. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I may ask the last question and, 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 and from then people can start asking more or sharing more. But how did you leave anti-black racism inside the prison system? It's, it, it, did you feel also this anti-black racism? There was something inside the prison that was like really like something that you were feeling that you were reflecting about anti-black racism? Mm. You see, I'm, I'm always, I, I can't, it's, Adriana, I, I apologize because it's always very difficult for me because I really don't know what anti-black racism is. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just know what it isn't, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. And it's, it's like, you know, how, how do you become aware um, of race, uh, of this particular, what you're asking for, if that's all you ever know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm gonna have to, I, I really can't answer that question, I don't think effectively. I, it's, this is, this is all I've ever known. So inside the prison, it, you just know that, you just get a feeling that something isn't right mm -hmm. because there's a system that everybody claims that is broken but broken to who? Um, as we always say, it's a system that works perfectly, perfectly as designed. And when you see that, when you look at the statistics, that more African-American men and women are incarcerated today than were slaves in the year 1850, you start to look and see the grand design. To me, everybody says slavery's ended a long time ago. No, no, no. Slavery exists now. It has just evolved. Mm -hmm. So when looking at anti-black racism, when looking at slavery, when looking at all of these issues, these issues, nothing has changed. These issues still exist. In the words of, of, of Malcolm X, he says, if someone sticks a six-inch blade into you, 
and pulls it out three inches. You can't call that progress. <laughs> and and I and I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Annie. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just gonna say, let's open it up. If somebody, if you want to type a question in the chat, or if you want to. Um, if you have something that you want to say out loud, you can unmute yourself and um, ask David if you have questions. The floor is open. David, it's Camille. Hello, Camille. Hi. I just want to thank you for being here this evening and for sharing. Um, I feel so blessed to have been able to listen to you and I really just don't have a question but I just want to thank you for what you're doing for young people thank you thank you so there's a question in the chat from Sonia saying how can we help I don't know if there's an answer to that or um, or else Mary actually was Mary bowing in also to ask a question. Yeah, why don't we have Mary and then you can think about the other one, David. <laughs> yeah, I can't answer the question, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, really um, stellar. It was really, really good. And I just so simply just to catch how you went into the breathing exercises with these young men and um, got them grounded, you know, right in their bellies and so simply and so powerfully, it was, it was beautiful. It, we can all use it in our teachings. Um, but I wanted to ask you what, what your experience has been with um, hmm, recruiting white allies or people of other colors in, into your, your work, um, or is that something that people have come to you, or you know, where have you found any, any allies? Oh, I have allies everywhere. Um, Wow. I mean, I don't know. Please tune in to our, our, our one in four podcast. Uh, well, we, we work. I have a beautiful team. Bea Spadaccini is the executive producer. She is an amazing. She does so many amazing things. We have a beautiful team put together that we really try to engage um, and elevate the conversation about uh, prison reform and reentry. Um, with that and the work that I do, I have, th this is a rainbow of color. You know, this is a rainbow of color. No one is turned away. And I don't, I, I, the, most of my exclusive work isn't, isn't, um, isn't with, um, isn't just dedicated towards people of color. It's, it, this is universal. So, yeah. Yeah, Mary, thank you. So there's the question, how can we help? And there's the question, can we donate to your organization? So those two questions are available and anyone else who wants to ask. Oh, absolutely. How can you help? Um, absolutely. You can, you can always, you know, I'm an independent contract point, but you could always donate to article 730 through cash app or Venmo and, 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 and help keep this process going because the bigger picture is, is to offer uh, wellness centers into every middle school across the District of Columbia. And instead of, um, uh, um, instead of criminalizing our young children, we give them the tools and the techniques to heal. And wellness center goes as far as, you know, we have, we have a complete curriculum designed for young folks just to help them deal with whatever trauma they've gone through and teaching them the process of healing. And most of it is done through music, through audio, through sound, through feeling, through emotion, and, uh, and, and to get funding to be able to walk into a school and say, no, 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 we know that this is a, 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 low, a, a, low function, a, a low functioning school who really needs our help that doesn't have the money to be able to walk in and say, we can offer these services that are already paid for, that is a dream come true. So please, Article 730, um, 
you can definitely cash app is open with article 730 Venmo article 730 um, all your donations and anything else would, would, would be is greatly needed and would be greatly appreciated also you can tune in um, you can please subscribe to uh, my uh, new YouTube page. Uh, it's called The World Next Door Sounds, powered by Article 730. And World Next Door Sounds, powered by Article 730. If you look at this new YouTube page that we've, we've done, it offers different places to, you know, where, where you can calm yourself, gives you different audio tunes to really, if you're going through anxiety or any kind of social, emotional issues, it's a one-stop shop to just click on to the audio that you may need to just soothe, soothe yourself. Um, yeah. Thank you, David. That's wonderful. I know um, Bea happens to be on the call and she wanted to say something, ask question or share something. Yes, thank uh -oh. you, Annie. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you, Bea. I'm so honored to have you on, on, on our team. You, you've become a brother to us, to, to I think, with Tim and Khadija. Um, a couple of things that I would like to share. One is that today is the day of empathy. So this is a movement that uh, on criminal justice reform and um, led by Van Jones and, and there was an entire day of incredible bringing together different activists from different states talking about policy and about disrupting the system and designing a new system, like Dave was saying, and it's so coincidental, but not really, that Dave is also so aligned with this work, and it, his webinar happens to be today. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one thing. Another thing I want to say is that um, I know that Dave had an amazing office for a while at WeWork, mm -hmm. and he really does need support with a space for Article 730 when we get beyond this um, COVID-19 isolation. But um, I really urge folks to help Dave have this space because he was holding classes for returning citizens, mindfulness, and he really needs support in creating that, whether it's at a WeWork type of space or uh, in, word, in, in particular words of the, dist, uh, of the District of Columbia that he feels are um, adequate for ensuring that the most number of young men can come and feel safe mm -hmm. and safe and able to feel vulnerable. He needs support with that and I want to put that out. Um, that said, I'm going to bow out. Thank you, Bea. Um, I think Hello. that we can put those resources and those links up on our website after this, um, since we don't have like the Venmo or the, unless you want to tell us that, and I can put it in the chat, David, your Venmo and your Cash App, but also if people wanted to be in touch with you to support you in bigger ways or different ways, is there a way they can get in touch with you? Oh yeah. Um, if you just, if you type in article 730.com, there's all of my, I believe all of my contact information is there. Right. And also the programs, uh, with reentry that, uh, that, that, uh, that I'm, that, that I've, that I'm working with in the individuals that I'm working with, but all of my information, contact information, uh, phone number, email addresses, it's, through article730.com. And I will uh, put up um, my information on Venmo, about Venmo and, um, and Cash App. But I believe, now Venmo is under my name, David Sampe, S-A-M-P-E, and Cash App is strictly article730. Okay, so, so let me just make sure I get it right. Your Venmo, Venmo is just at S A M P E. No, at David, S A M P E. Okay, S A M P E. Okay, and then your uh, Cash App is. Cash App is Article Seven Thirty. Dollar sign. Oh, dollar sign. Thanks. 
dollar sign article. Oh, wait, seven. I'm not. Somehow, I'm not giving this to everybody. My bad. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Yeah, I guess it is dollar sign article seven. Okay, and then let me send this Venmo one. I appreciate that more than. Yeah, anything. and also there's a couple more questions, David. Yes. Um, yes. let's see. There's one on. I'll give you all of them. You can choose what you want to talk about. What would reparations for the collective trauma look like? One, here's an easier question. Do your children meditate? And then um, are there similar programs in place targeting young black women? So those are three questions. Ah, three questions. Let's, let's, my son definitely meditates. The quick story about that is uh, when we just moved here from New York City about a year and a half ago, first day of school. By the time mid semester, by the half, first half of the first semester started, my son was pretty much through the transition of moving from New York to DC, was failing miserably, miserably. He was labeled um, a problem in the school. Right there, we started meditating. Seven minutes a day, seven minutes a day. My son hasn't been off of honor roll since. From that moment forward, as he was a tyrant to the school, within, within the next grading period, he was the darling of the school. Uh, it, within that same year that they pointed, that, that they tried to ostracize him, within that same year, his turnaround was so great, they asked him to speak on Congress for climate change all through the power of seven minutes of meditation, he was able to calm his mind, refocus himself. So it's a daily part of our life. Um, second question about women in, um, incarcerated women. Or young One black women. Young women. Young women. Uh, yeah, at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, with this, I, I have to plug a very good friend of mine who is part of my family is Lashana. Lashana uh, Etheridge, who runs The Wire, and that is Women, uh, women Inward Reentry re Services, where they offer pretty much wraparound services for women coming out of prison. Um, and The Wire, um, who is run by Lashana, does beautiful work, and I'm very much affiliated with them. We are all a part of the same family and the reparations. I don't know where that starts. I mean, I, part of something I want to talk about here early in the speech, but I never got a chance to really talk about it, was just how do you talk about reparations? How do you talk about how much money is owed? You see, I come from a place, a race of people who've been criminalized in this country criminalized and our only crime against this against us is that we built it. We built this country. Think about what that must feel like. We built, whether you want to admit it or not, we built this country. The wealth of this country came from the backs of my ancestors. And when I turn around, I can't pass any generational wealth on to my son, while my next door neighbors are passing down generational wealth to theirs. And the only difference is my ancestors died to build this country, blood, sweat, and tears. How do you put that into dollars? How do you, how do, you do that? You see, on this dollar bill, $50 bill, you see an American hero. I see my slave master. Think about what that does to the psyche. So what is the true amount for reparations? How do you turn that back, turn back time? And that's a, that's a whole nother webinar <laughs> about what is owed. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you.
Can I ask a question about the meditation, meditating with your kid? Sure. Do you use uh, a special technique? Do you sit with him? How does it work? How can you bring your kids to meditate with you, uh, especially in these times that will be really helpful for all? Well, we do, we do um, our practices mostly revolves around breath work. Um, I am affiliated with International Association of Human Values and meditate under the Sri Sri Ravi Sankar. Sankar meditation mm -hmm. and a lot of that is breath work so we start out with kind of like the breathing technique we offer today was to breathe in deeply for four seconds hold for four release for six hold for two repeat that process three times then we do something called the power breath and this mostly wakes him up and gets him ready for school in the morning where he sits up straight back straight and inhale <laughs> Exhale. He does that about three rounds of 15. And then we go through a breath breathing techniques. See, when you focus all your attention on the breath, breath work, it's very difficult for you to think anything else. Mm -hmm. And even if you have fluttering thoughts, it always gives you the option to observe the thoughts rather than being the thoughts and then come and bring it back to the breath. So we do very small, quick techniques like this before he walks out the door to clear his head and then he's off to school. And that is that, that was our normal routine until, well, now. <laughs> and now we're shifting the focus and really trying to see what works in, 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 um, under the circumstances. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dave. That, that's really helpful, actually. <laughs> so yeah. I think like we have time maybe for one more thing. Oh, Magda, Magda is there. Yes. So this will be our last question, and then we'll have to wrap up. Okay. So, David, I think I missed when you start. When were you first in jail? How old were you? I was, well, first, I, was, I must have been about 18 years old. Um, okay. That particular experience that I wrote about, I was 19, and I was offered a youth act program instead of going down and doing serious time. And what the youth act, what I believe, what I thought it was, with it was a re rehabilitation uh, 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 program. But what it, that's what it was on paper. But in reality, all it was was solitary confinement. So yeah, it's so. Um, it, started very it start, started very young but i also finished very young okay so i i wanted to ask you so can you remember somebody from the outside who provided you a great deal of support my family mm -hmm. see why when, when i can remember the one thing that saved me from solitary confinement was the books mm -hmm. you know the, and i had outside i my father sent me books constantly and I, and I and I never forget that forever that that was truly what saved me it gave me an outlet to be able to disappear literally into a book mm -hmm. and um and, and I've, I've wrote many many things about that time be, uh, literally falling into a book I can remember a certain time in my life uh while in solitary where I kind of lost reality for a second and i couldn't remember was i a native american on the plains living within living on the plains reading about a man in solitary confinement or was i a man in solitary confinement reading about a native american on the plains and that was showed that I remember that moment vividly as a time where my mind kind of you, you're locked in these confined you're, you're so confined you lose sense of reality but thank god I had a book you know because if not then you just only have four walls so thank you that was a beautiful way to wrap up the session 
Um, I just want to express my gratitude, David, for your vulnerability and your willingness to share so much from your heart. Um, I've just so appreciated and been moved by your sharing. Um, Adriana, do you want to say anything and then we'll have a final bell? No, same thing, David. Thank you so much. It was really inspiring. I think it's helpful always. And um, in these times that we are living right now, it's more to, to know what other people like you have been going through and try to be the in the bright side of the things right now. Thank you so much for your sharing from your heart. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate you all. Thank you. And I see that people are posting in the chat, David. So if you want to look there, people are sending gratitude. I'll invite one sound of the bell. We can breathe together. And then maybe let's have a small sound where we bow to each other to finish. And then we can have some announcements after that. So from our time together this evening, may all of us here together and all beings everywhere live with ease and joy and freedom. And may all beings everywhere be liberated from suffering and the root causes of suffering. And since we can't really stand up together, we'll just have this next little bell to bow to each other. So everyone can join in this bowing to each other if you feel inspired. I'm gonna go to gallery view so I can see everybody bow. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here tonight, everyone. We so appreciate it. Thank Please you, everybody. Sharing about this project with your friends and family and other people, neighbors, and keep contributing so we can continue to offer this. And we will have another one in April, and you'll get an email about it on the same subject. And then in June, I'm very excited. I'm bringing two really amazing women from the um, Justice Funders Collective to speak about money. Mm -hmm. And in this context and giving in this current environment and generally how do we give to social justice causes and how is that will tie in mindfulness somehow. <laughs> yeah. so, Adriana, do you want to say anything? Yes, later, later in the year, we also will have uh, uh, one webinar with Brenda, who is a dreamer, Mexican dreamer living here, who's going to share about the her experience as a dreamer, as an activist in, in, the, in the area as well. And uh, another thing that I want to share, if you want to share the voice about our program, if you go to the website, Rachel can tell you, but you will find the wording, the images, or whatever you need, if you can help us to share the voice through with your friends, with your listservs, wherever you want. You will have all the information and all the materials needed in our website. And thank you again, everybody, for being here with us and for your support to this program. And as I, we always say, this is a way that we are learning together. That's, that, that's the, the goal of this, to learn together and to open our hearts and our minds to the injustice and to the topics that we need to be taking putting out our attention. If you'd like to turn on your um, sound, unmute yourself when we can just say good night and thank you. And we'll see you next month. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Adriana. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Just gracias. Thank you. Natalie, gracias. Thank you, David. Be safe, everybody. Be safe. Be well. Adios. Love you. Thank you. Bye.